Last night, I did something I never, ever do. I went online and surfed the internet. I, I, some people spend all their time on YouTube, things like that, I don't. But yesterday, I wanted to know who is the greatest among all the preachers. And I looked up, of course, the, the question was, which of our preachers make the most money? I'm disappointed to say I was not on the list. The amount of money some of our televangelists and others earn is um, deplorable. Uh, the most I saw was 120 million. That was net worth, that was not annual earnings. But to get to 120 million, they earn more than I do. The least was 40 million. And these are the top 10. And they are seen as people who have made it in the world of preaching and in the world of church management and in the world of church growth. And they, for the most part, subscribe to a theology called prosperity gospel. And prosperity gospel, it turns out, I read about that last night too, started in about the 1880s, where church experts said, well, if God loves you, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. If God loves you, you will have a covenant with God, and following the book of James today, ask and it will be given to you. You will have healing, you will have money, you will have uh, a, a wife of great wisdom and repute, as in Proverbs 31. You will have it made. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> um, I could learn to preach like they do, I bet, I, I, but maybe not. Um, I want to say that the gospel that I read, and especially that we read today and we read last week, says something kind of different. Today, Jesus is walking along with the disciples and he is talking about what it means to be the Messiah. Last week, I don't know what your sermon was about, but last week I preached on the gospel that said, who do you say that I am? And Peter, in his wonderful wisdom, says, ah, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, you got it. Good work, Peter. And then Jesus says, and this Messiah is going to go to Jerusalem and die. And Peter takes Jesus aside. I, I love this scene. If he actually doesn't want to say, you're wrong, in front of the other 11, he takes him aside and says, uh-uh, you're the Messiah. You're going to give us that prosperity. You're going to take care of the Romans. You're going to take care of sickness. You're going to take care of poverty. It'll all be good. And what is Jesus' response to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. That's not what you want to hear from Jesus. I'm sure of that. And Jesus then goes on, this gospel of Mark in chapters 8, 9, and 10, I commend it to you because it's just, it turns our whole world upside down. It says everything you hope and believe is the other way. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you're going to be suffering. You're going to be a servant one of the last things Jesus did was to wash the feet of his disciples. That's what bottom servants did. That's what the Messiah does. Jesus was not on the list of 10 wealthiest preachers either. Jesus was someone who said, serve, be humble, 
Bring out the good in others. Be part of a community. As the community of St. Hilda, St. Patrick, you, um, I hear, struggle with money sometimes. Is that a fair statement? And <laughs> some heads are nodding here. And I want to encourage you, because you don't struggle with being community, or not as far as I can tell. You are welcoming. You love one another. You care for one another. You know one another and allow others to know you. I think you've got your priorities going really well. And you serve one another in so many ways. And Jesus, you are following what Jesus tells us to do. It's not about becoming wealthy and famous in the millions. It is how we serve one another. I want to um, share with you uh, what I do when I'm not um, either disabled with a shoulder injury or here at St. Hilda and St. Patrick. I, for the last 10 years, have been working with an organization called Food for the Poor. And we are a, you can go to foodforthepoor.org and read all about us. We are a ministry of relief and development, um, active in the Episcopal Church, Catholic Church, Lutheran Church particularly, and we serve in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and we help the poorest of the poor with about $1 billion of aid a year. We build houses. We feed two million people a day. We build schools and hospitals and clinics. We provide help in all sorts of ways. The prosperity gospel people, uh, generally the theology from the 1880s was if you are sick or poor or troubled, it's because of sin in your life and you don't have enough faith and you don't follow Jesus closely enough. Well, that's most of us, I would say. Most of us have some trouble in our life. And they would say poverty is the biggest sign of failure in your Christian life. The people that Food for the Poor serves, that I visit when I'm in, and, and minister with when I'm in Honduras or Guatemala or some other country are terrible Christians, if that's true. But it's not true, <laughs> in case you're wondering. So I want to tell you two stories today. One story um, I'm going to tell all of you, and the other one is going to be part of a children's sermon because my stole is downright distracting today. It's so beautiful. But I want to tell you about a woman named Iris who lives in Guatemala. And Iris lives in a little village on the top of a mountain and they farm all sorts of amazing things. And it's a lush area. Farming is very successful. The thing that's not successful there is getting the produce to market and understanding nutrition. And so the people there are suffering from malnutrition. The closest doctor was five hours away. The uh, closest school was in town, but it was kind of in an outdoor field. Um, there was very little available in that town, and it was a dangerous place to live. And Iris had two small children, and she, uh, one day, food for the poor and their agents in the area came to her and said, would you like to grow some pigs? And Ira said, sure. Now I need your help, okay, because we're going to tell this story. And pigs, especially you two, okay, can you help me with this? We're going to do piggies. Hold your hands like this. Come on, guys. Piggies. In about four or five months, do you know what happens to piggies? 
They become, I can't even reach that far, pigs. And Iris was taught how to raise piggies into pigs. She was handed, to begin with, at a huge cost of $100, two piggies, a bag of piggy food, and instructions on how to raise piggies into pigs. And she raised into and took them to market and sold the pigs and came home and took her little house and added to her kitchen so that her children could have a space to do homework and eat and get some nutrition. But she also bought two more. And what did she do? She grew them into? Excellent, you're getting this. And she took them to market. And she came back and she built a playground next to her house. And it was an area where the children in the neighborhood could play. And the children otherwise were playing in the street where it was very dangerous. They were assaulted, they were hit by cars. But now the, there was a, a playground for the children. And she bought three more. And she kept doing this, growing piglets into pigs. Eventually, she learned to make bacon herself. And she made more money. And I sat down after meeting Iris, and I went, oh my goodness, look at what she's done. She's done all of this. And in a whole year, she could earn about $1,200. $1,200 isn't a lot of money in our society. It certainly isn't $120 million. And I said to our leader, that's only about $1,200 a year. And she said, and she used to earn about $250 a year. And this has changed her life. But after about two years of this, Iris said, now I want to give thanks to God. How can I help? And she said, I would like to train other women in raising. And this community now has the following. A playground, safety for children, a schoolhouse, a medical clinic, and a lot of women raising piglets <coughs> to pigs. Her vision of success and making it big and being in the internet for most successful pig farmer was not to be on the internet, but to serve others, to serve those around her to help others in need. And I would ask us, how are we going to do that? How are all of us going to do something like that to help others? How is St. Hilda, St. Patrick going to yay the vision? in your community, inside and outside your community. In the next sermon, when more children are in the room, are going to be about the stole. And I'll tell you right now, this stole was made by women in Peru so their children can go to school. Not so that I have the most beautiful stole, but there are so many wonderful ways to get the vision of how we can serve God and God's beloved people. Amen.